For the next moon mission, NASA geologists choose a more dangerous landing site, the heavily cratered Lunar Highlands. I've always thought that our crew, Apollo 12, could have flown any mission as good as anybody else, probably, except 13. NASA makes scientific research a primary mission objective. The crew of Apollo 13 takes special training in lunar geology. The rocks astronauts bring back could begin to answer questions about where the moon came from. The geology training was really a lot of focus on the uh, protocol of sampling. So when we got back, they could understand uh, where they come from and how they fit into the context of the, uh, of the area. The commander of Apollo 13 is Jim Lovell, a veteran of two Gemini missions and Apollo 8. He's NASA's most experienced astronaut. One of the things I wanted to do before I retired from active spaceflight was to land on the moon. That's the reason why I had got into NASA in the first place. That was the whole thing. So I was looking forward to 13. Jim Lovell's crew has been training together for almost a year, even before being assigned to Apollo 13. But the team has broken up just three days before launch. Jack Swigert is a last minute replacement when the command module pilot is exposed to the measles. On every flight, we ended up getting pressed into the corner. There were a lot of last minute details. Changes were still being made. Swigert joins the two lunar landers, Jim Lovell and Fred Hayes. Their destination, a difficult landing site in the moon's Fram Morrow Hills. You know, when you're an astronaut, you've got to buy in to a lot of risk. Nobody's going to save you if the hardware doesn't work. You buy into that stuff if you're going to be an astronaut. If you can't buy into it, don't be an astronaut. He has 25 seconds and counting, and Apollo 13 is go. You know, you're sort of relaxed, because there's only two things that are going to happen. Either it's going to go as planned, or something is going to go wrong. This was my last chance to get to the moon. Ignition sequence has started. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit and we have liftoff at 2.13. The Saturn V building up to 7.6 million pounds of thrust and it has cleared the tower. This is Mission Control Houston. We appear to have a good first stage at this point. The dynamics officer says the trajectory looks good. We show a one half mile in altitude at this time. Apollo 13 is just the eighth launch of the most powerful rocket ever built. Roll complete and we're pitching. Roger that. Stand by for mode one, Bravo. Gene Krantz monitors all aspects of the launch from his desk at Mission Control in Houston. The flight director's job description is very simple. It's only one sentence long. It says to take any actions needed for crew safety and mission success. Crew safety is number one, mission success is number two. Uh, Fred, one more thing on the TV, if you could come down to F-22 again. Uh... I was pretty busy uh, getting equipment out and occasionally getting a chance to sneak a peek out the window. Even though you've seen pictures and footage from previous flights, it's unbelievable when you're there looking out. More than halfway to the moon, the crew broadcasts live from the spaceship for television viewers on Earth. Okay, uh, a couple of square packages I now have my hand on here are our emergency uh, oxygen. The astronauts don't know the networks aren't carrying their broadcast. Missions to the moon are becoming routine, and not just for the public. The controllers said they're bored to death because really it was, you know, everything was going right down the flight plan uh, perfectly. The uh, shift rotations at mission control had uh, come off very smoothly. Everything was on track. 
As the crew prepares for seven hours of sleep, Mission Control makes one last routine request. 13, we've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like it to uh, stir up your cryo tanks. This is where we turn on some fans in the oxygen tanks to basically stir them up to make them uniform so we can measure them. Uh, Jack Swagger acknowledged our request for the stir. And okay. Stand by. Swagger then threw two switches. A light came on that said there was something wrong with your electrical system. But before we could digest that information, two more lights came on that said two out of three of your fuel cells had just died. It was now 55 hours, 55 minutes and four seconds from launch. My voice lips come live. Hey, flight, you've had a computer restart. Another one says antenna switch. Another one says main bus interval. And then down from the spacecraft level calls. Okay, we've had a problem here. Can I say again, please? Lights were coming on, noise all over, jets were firing. I had no idea what was going on. I looked up at Fred Hayes. I could tell from his expression he had no idea. RCS system, cryogenics, electrical power, AC power, DC power. I quickly looked at Jack Swikert. Uh, his eyes were as white as saucers. He didn't know what was occurring. We had a pretty large bang associated with the um, caution and warning there. I thought that uh, we've had another power glitch. We'd had two earlier in my shift. And we're going to solve this problem quickly and get back on track. Mission Control, of course, was being a couple hundred thousand miles away, was a little bit slower in realizing what was happening. They were chasing down a trail that said it was an instrumentation problem. Voice communications was solid. But a telemetry made absolutely no sense. But the real impact came when Jim Lovell was looking out the hatch in and says, hey, Houston. Yeah, that's, that's because of the AC. And it looks to me looking out the uh, hatch that we are venting something. We are, uh, we are venting something out uh, into the uh, into space. I could see a sea of debris around us of uh, little twinkly things um, moving out away from the spacecraft, which I'm assuming is frozen oxygen. Now, Jack, is that right? Roger, we copy your venting. I was in mission control, and uh, Jim Lovell said we got a problem, and he was right. I thought we'd lost him when I saw that second oxygen tank leaking out. We were in serious, serious trouble. From then on, it was survival mode. OK, now, let's everybody keep cool. Let's solve the problem, but let's not make it any worse by guessing. What they do know is bad enough. Both oxygen tanks are losing pressure quickly. Two of three fuel cells are dead. Without oxygen, the remaining fuel cell won't last long. The uh, quantity indicator on the second oxygen tank was moving downward. Not very fast, but nevertheless uh, diminishing. And so it was apparent that we were going to lose that second uh, oxygen tank. The command module is dying. Its fuel cells need oxygen to produce electricity. And the crew needs oxygen to breathe. Their only hope is the lunar module. I realized we were shortly going to be out of oxygen, and they were going to have to use the lunar module as a lifeboat to get home. The lunar module has its own oxygen and power, but it's only equipped to support two people for two days. It's going to take four days to get three astronauts back okay, to Earth. Uh, Jack, about how long Every it? minute is about critical. Very long procedure, Fred. Uh, we figure we've got about 15 minutes worth of power left in the command module, so uh, we want you to start uh, 
getting over in the limb and getting some power on that. Following standard uh, procedure, procedure, it should take lunar okay. module pilot Fred Hayes two hours to activate okay, the limb. The I uh, drifted down. We had our activation checklist that we used. As I went through the checklist, draw a big X through whole sections and move on. With just moments to spare, Hayes powers up the lunar module. But living in the LEM means they can't fire the powerful command module rockets to reverse course back to Earth. They'll need to make the longer trip around the moon. I made the decision so the Apollo that we would go around the moon as opposed to use a direct abort, because I would have to jettison my lunar module. And I didn't want to lose my lunar module, which I considered a lifeboat. Mission control, we're looking, uh, now looking towards an alternate mission. Swinging around the moon and using the uh, lunar module power systems. That sounds like good news. Lovell fires the engine of the lunar module to set their course around the moon and home again. The lightweight LEM offers little protection against the extreme conditions in deep space. To conserve power, only essential instruments are turned on. It was flimsy, uh, and it was not designed for long habitation between the moon and the Earth, which is pretty cold. The temperature kept dropping all the way down to zero Celsius, you know, 34 degrees Fahrenheit. It was a uh, pretty uh, bad environment to be sitting in for the number of days uh, that we had to uh, exist. 77 hours into the mission, Apollo 13 circles around the far side of the moon, using its gravity for a slingshot back to Earth. We're out of communication with the ground during that period. For 26 minutes, mission control hears nothing but static. There was a point, uh, I call it a, sort of a second uh, point of disappointment on my part that we weren't going to get to go down there. The biggest question for mission control is whether the limited supplies in the LEM will keep the crew alive long enough to reach Earth. Everybody was making constant calculations. Do we have enough electrical power? Do we have enough water? Do we have enough oxygen? The answer is definitive. The crew won't survive. They have to get home faster. After uh, we passed behind the moon, we had to come up with a technique to uh, accelerate our return journey. We were going to have to use the engine of the lunar module a second time to speed up to get back. Otherwise, we'd be out of power. Ignition. Thrust looks good. Shut down. Hang in there, it won't be long. The extra boost cuts nine hours off the return journey. With careful rationing of water and power, their supplies should last. Should nothing else go wrong, uh, we had a shot at getting back to an entry. While conditions in the LEM are miserable, the low temperatures won't kill them, but every breath they take produces a poison that can. Carbon dioxide was beginning to build up in the lunar module atmosphere. The canisters to remove carbon dioxide in the lunar module, uh, there were only enough of them for two people. We were three. And as the CO2 level in the blood goes up, your muscle function is gonna stop. And you're gonna lose consciousness and die there are spare canisters in the command module, but a basic design error renders them useless. The command module carbon dioxide scrubber was square, but the lunar module was round. So we had to rig up a deal that was, would work, this square deal in this round hole. The crew was faced with suffocation. So engineering came up with the idea to fabricate an adapter. They brought it in, we got down on our hands and knees, and they made me build it. And once I had built it, 
They said, okay, you know you know how to build it, now go tell Jack Swagger how to build it. We did it with uh, duct tape, with a piece of plastic, a piece of cardboard, and an old sock. And he plugged it in, and lo and behold, that CO2 level just came down so slick. It was great. As they approach Earth, the crew prepares for one of the most dangerous parts of their mission, re-entry. They need to get back in the command module and jettison the LEM that's kept them alive. We were concerned because this command module had not been powered up for days, and so it had gotten very cold inside. And uh, how was the heat shield going to respond? And is it going to work through this, the heat of the reentry? We're not going to be able to do anything about it, uh, and we got to get through the entry. It's the only way to get home. lost communications, there was a, what we call blackout due to the ionized atmosphere. The blackout should last three minutes. Hello, you know, Aquarius, hello, Apollo 13, and no response. Two minutes now from time of drogue deployment. After four minutes, Still nothing. But you just had to sit there and listen through all that static, waiting for somebody to, uh, to say, Houston. joyful and all very tired and there didn't seem to be anything else to say you know any mission that you can bring your crew back home from is a success the men of Apollo 13 by their poise and skill, under the most intense kind of pressure, epitomize the character that accepts danger and surmounts it. Theirs is the spirit that built America. 